Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one of the most intense cases that I have ever looked into. I went into this case with a very surface level understanding of what happened, but the more I researched, the more I found. I spent so much time researching this case because there's so much information to sift through, it's crazy. This case is such a mess and there are so many different layers that it might get confusing at times, so it just bear with me as we get through it all. This is also a case that has so many rumors, so much false information, so if you know anything that I didn't include in this video, it might be because I either didn't think that it was necessary to include or maybe it hasn't been confirmed and I just didn't feel comfortable including any sort of rumor. I tried only including information that is confirmed and if there is anything in this video that I'm speculating about, then I will make that known throughout the video. But with that, let's get into the case. There is so much information to go over, so let's just go ahead and get started. First, we will be discussing the death of Mallory Beach. Mallory Beach was born April 18th, 1999 in Walterboro, South Carolina. Her parents are Philip Harley Beach and Renee Searson Beach, and she was the youngest of two sisters, Morgan and Savannah. She went to Wade Hampton High School where she played on the soccer team, was active in the student government, and was in the beta club. She was described as a follower of God, attending the Hug and Oak Church of God in Cummings. After graduating high school, she spent a semester at the University of South Carolina and had been working at a store called its Retail Therapy Boutique in Beaufort. She also loved animals and liked going hunting with her dad. She actually loved animals so much that a nonprofit called Mal's Pals was created in her honor, which collects money and donates all of it to the Hampton Animal Shelter. She was also described as a very giving person who cared deeply about others. Her father told a story about a woman who recognized him in a grocery store. She recognized him as Mallory's father and she told told him about how her son went to high school with Mallory. He was one of those kids who everyone just bullied and picked on. He didn't really have any friends, but Mallory went out of her way to let him know that it will be okay. She spent time with him and wanted him to know that she cared about him. She was overall just such a kind, compassionate young girl. Now, February 23rd, 2019 was supposed to be a fun and exciting day for 19-year-old Mallory. She liked to have fun and go to some parties just as so many other teens her age did. So her and her boyfriend at the time, Anthony, decided to go on their friend's boat that evening with some of their other friends. So all together going on the boat that night was Mallory, Anthony, Anthony's cousin Connor, Connor's girlfriend Miley, and their friend Paul Murdaugh, and his girlfriend Morgan. The boat was a 17-foot Sea Hunt boat owned by Paul Murdaugh's family. So Paul Murdaugh, who was 19 years old at the time, used his older brother Buster's ID to buy more than $45 worth of beer and liquor from the Parker's Convenience Store in Ridgeland. A witness from the store remembered seeing Paul buying the alcohol and thought that Paul looked a little bit too young to be drinking. But the cashier just sort of glanced at his ID and didn't really take the time to check his physical appearance. This was because, according to Paul's girlfriend, he didn't look anything like his older brother. His older brother weighed significantly more than him and was over six inches taller than him. But nonetheless, the cashier sold him the alcohol and said, y'all be careful tonight before Paul left with it. It was reported that after buying this alcohol, Paul walked out with the alcohol raised above his head and looked triumphant, saying that he was able to buy all of this alcohol. They then went over to the island, which is a $1.45 million property owned by Paul's father on Chichesi Creek around two miles away from the Parker's convenience store. There, the friends drank a bunch of the alcohol that they bought for the night, and at around 7 p.m. that night, the friends launched the boat. Now, I will note that this boat did not have working lights. In order to see, those on board had to hold up flashlights in order to give them the visibility that they needed to drive at night. Now, it was February in South Carolina. It was pretty cold outside, so a lot of people wondered why they would decide to take a boat instead of driving. Obviously, being on a boat in those weather conditions probably isn't 
isn't the most pleasant. You're not going to be going swimming. You're going to be out in the water where it's going to be even colder. So why would you even want to take a boat in the first place? Well, apparently the reason that they wanted to take a boat instead of a car was because they knew about all the police checkpoints on the road, checking to see if people were drinking and driving and they wanted to be able to drink. So they wanted to drive the boat instead of a car so that they wouldn't get pulled over at these checkpoints. So they drove the boat around 20 nautical miles across Archer's Creek in Beaufort over to the homes of James and Christy Wood. Christy Wood is actually the principal of the Brunson Elementary School in Hampton County. So I'm not sure if she was the principal when they went to the elementary school and that's how they knew where she lived or I'm not exactly sure how they knew to go over to her house. But either way, the couple was having an oyster roast at their home in Pocky Island. Once the friends got there, they docked the boat at the woods dock and joined them for the party. There, the group drank a lot of the alcohol that they already had, and they were also being served alcohol by the woods. This entire time, the woods knew that they were teens and they were aware of them becoming intoxicated, but they continued serving them alcohol and letting them drink the alcohol that they brought. The group was there for around five hours before they all decided to leave. At this point, Paul was already pretty intoxicated, but he insisted on driving his boat back to the family's property. So they all piled on the boat and they went on their way. But on their way back, Paul insisted that they stop at more bars on the way home. Four of them, including Mallory, Anthony, Miley, and Morgan, really didn't want to stop. It was already 1 a.m. at that point and they really just wanted to go back. As Paul was driving the boat, the six of them were just bickering and arguing about some of them not wanting to go back to the bars, but some of them wanting to. But Paul didn't want to go home and he was the one driving the boat, so they ended up stopping at the Henry C. Chambers Waterfront Park in Beaufort, which is right by their little downtown area. So they parked the boat at a dock there and Connor and Paul went to Luther's Rare and Well Done, which is a bar known for being a little vintage bar right on the waterfront. And once they were there, again, even though they were minors, they were continuing to be served alcohol, so they continued drinking. At the bar, Paul got even more intoxicated and he started getting pretty out of control. Those who knew him said that when he would drink that much, he would either start acting completely erratically or he would get very aggressive and angry. While at the bar, he apparently tried getting into a fight with someone and started throwing chairs. Then while Paul and Connor were at the bar, the rest of them stayed back by the boat. Mallory, Anthony, Miley, and Morgan were all just sitting together on a large wooden swing, looking out at the water front waiting for Paul and Connor to get back. Paul and Connor were only in the bar for around 15 minutes before they returned back to the group at around 2 a.m. At this time, all of the teens were intoxicated, but like I said, Paul was pretty much out of control level drunk. But they all got back into the boat and once again, Paul insisted that he wanted to drive everybody back. Now, according to Anthony, the two of them got into a pretty big fight because he was trying to stop Paul from driving the boat. But everyone else that was present said that they too tried to stop Paul from driving the boat. His girlfriend said that she was trying to get him to back down, but he refused. He just kept yelling back at her and saying stuff like, shut the F up, nobody else is driving my boat. Anthony suggested that they all just take an Uber home since he knew that none of them should be driving them back. But Paul and Connor were apparently being very stubborn and Anthony knew that there was no way of talking them out of going on the boat. Like I said, Anthony was in intoxicated at that point, but he was nowhere near the level that Paul was. Anthony was the oldest of the group and he was probably the most responsible and he was the one that had the most clear head at the time, so he probably wasn't that intoxicated. And he said that he knew that they shouldn't have stayed on the boat but he knew that even if he left, the others wouldn't have wanted to. He said that he just didn't feel right leaving Paul and Connor to their own devices on the boat. He thought that he should stick around to make sure that nothing happened. So in the end, all of the boaters ended up staying on the boat. They started off driving pretty slowly. They were just sort of idling in circles for a while, just sort of drifting along. But as all that was going on, everybody just continued fighting and fighting. And while that was going on, 
Paul was just acting absolutely insane, making a complete fool out of himself. Those are not my words, those are the words of the others that were on the boat with him. Those who knew Paul said that whenever he would get really drunk, he turned on this alter ego named Timmy, where he would do outrageous things and then blame it on Timmy and everybody would say, oh, here comes Timmy again. So despite it being only 40 degrees outside at that time, Paul started stripping down to his boxers. Nobody really knows why. That's just something that he did when he got really drunk. People said that at that point, he seemed like he was on drugs and he had done drugs like weed and cocaine in his past, but nobody on the boat thought that he was doing them at that time. He was just acting, quote, like he was on drugs, but it's thought that he was just really, really drunk at that time. But Either way, as he was stripping down and just acting crazy, he left the wheel of the boat unattended several times, leaving Connor to take over intermittently. Again, he did so even though he repeatedly said that nobody else was gonna be driving his boat because nobody else knew the river like he did. Also, as they were driving, Miley, who was Connor's girlfriend, was starting to get very angry and yell at him because again, it was really late and she actually did have work that next morning and she just wanted to go home. And then in the midst of all of this, Paul just started yelling at his girlfriend. She was sitting at the front of the boat, so he again would leave the wheel several times to just go up there and yell at her. Then at one point, he went up there and slapped her and just spit on her face and pushed her down to the ground. It's not really known exactly why, but again, he was just angry and out of control and was just acting ridiculous. Mallory was sitting at the back of the boat with Anthony and she was just getting so upset seeing all of this so she started yelling at Paul saying that he was just acting stupid and told him to stop but then Paul turned around and pointed at her and just by the look on his face Anthony could tell that he was about to say something very horrible to her but before he could get a word out Anthony said don't make that mistake so he didn't say anything. He just stared at Mallory for a second and then went back to the wheel. When he was at the wheel, he turned around and just started staring at Anthony for a second and then started staring around. And then all of a sudden, someone had slammed the throttle into acceleration, taking the boat from an idle two miles per hour to going extremely fast, so fast that the bow of the boat was sticking up in the air. No one saw exactly who messed with the throttle, but Anthony believes that it was most definitely Paul and he thinks that he did it on purpose after this little argument with Mallory. Anthony and Mallory had originally been sitting on the cooler in the middle of the boat, so like in the little aisle part, and she was sitting in his lap and Anthony said that he was just holding on to Mallory as they fell back as the boat was increasing in speed. They had fallen to the ground at this point, but Anthony was holding on to Mallory to try and keep her safe as the boat was just going so fast. They they drove a total of 5.6 nautical miles before there was a horrible crash. The boat had slammed into a bridge piling of the RC Berkeley Bridge. As the crash was happening, Anthony was knocked unconscious and was thrown off of the boat into the water. When he quickly regained consciousness, Anthony describes that in a split second, he didn't realize what had just happened, only realized that Mallory was no longer in his arms. He said it was like he just fell asleep on the boat and then suddenly suddenly woke up in freezing cold water. Anthony said that the current was going so fast in the river that by the time he had regained his consciousness, he was on the opposite side of the bridge from where they had crashed. So he grabbed the first pile that he could and looked around and found a bank that he could go swim to. So he swam up to the bank and just started screaming for Mallory. At that point on the bank, he was a little bit far away from the bridge. So he decided to get back into the water and swim over to where the bridge was. So so that he could get back to everybody else. Once he got there, he noticed that Paul was just laying in the dirt underneath the bridge on the ground. Anthony yelled, where's Mallory? And then Miley came running up to Anthony and was saying, what do you mean, where's Mallory? And that is when they all realized that she was just gone. So everybody started screaming out for Mallory. So by 2.26 a.m. on February 24th, 2019, Connor Cook called the Beaumont Police Station. When the operator picked up 
All they could hear was someone screaming Mallory over and over again. Connor told the dispatcher that there was a crash on Archer's Creek and that they need help. Anthony continued to search for Mallory as Connor was on the phone with the dispatcher. Eventually, Connor said on the phone, there is a female named Mallory Beach who is missing. As Connor was describing the boat and their location and everything else that happened, a female could be heard in the background screaming that she was losing blood. What bridge is it? Paul, what bridge is this? Paul, what bridge? 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Police fire, any of this? Hello? We're in a boat crash on Arthur Street. Where, where about on Arthur Street? In Arthur Street, the only bridge on Arthur Street. Archer Street? Archer's Creek. You Archer's Creek. Uh, Archer's Creek. Is it a thousand? Okay. What's going on? It's Bob Paris Island. Yeah. Right. What? What's going on? We get, we're in a boat crash. You know what? What kind of a? A boat crash. A, a boat. Did you say a boat crash? A boat crash. Okay, so you're at, uh, are you at the dock? Hello, are you, are you at the dock? No, we just crashed in a boat. Okay, are you in the water, or are you? We're, we're in the boat. Okay. We have someone missing. Okay, okay, hang on one second, okay? I'm calling in reference to a disabled, I'm sorry, a boat crash. It's six people on board. They currently have one missing. All right, it's in Archer's Creek, which is right there off of Paris Island. There's a bridge on Paris Island. They're underneath it. They crashed into the bridge. County's on scene. Port Royal's on scene. Um, evidently, the girl was sitting on her boyfriend's lap when they hit the bridge at a high rate of speed, and now she's missing. By 2.36 a.m., the U.S. Coast Guard in Charleston broadcasted a message asking all vessels to keep an eye out for a female in the water at Archer's Creek. As they waited for emergency services to arrive, Connor and his girlfriend climbed up to the causeway on the bridge. Anthony stayed on the bank searching for Mallory for quite some time, but eventually he too went up onto the bridge. By 2.40 a.m., police started showing up to the bridge. They said that one female, who I believe was Morgan, was still on the boat and they said that she was bleeding from her hand. They saw that Paul was also still on the boat with her and then they found the two on the bridge and also Anthony. They eventually accounted for all but one of the boaters. As police were taking down statements, they learned a little bit more about what happened leading up to the crash. And as they were taking down their statements, Paul was standing on the boat in only his boxers and he was talking on the phone with someone, telling them what happened. And then he was seen starting to cry, telling this person that Mallory was missing. By 3.19 a.m., Paul, Connor, Miley, and Morgan were all in an ambulance on their way to the hospital. But as they were being transported, according to an EMS worker, Paul became very agitated and aggressive towards Towards them, so this EMS worker requested that an officer ride in the back with them to ensure everybody's safety. So that night, Anthony had refused medical treatment, wanting to stay on the scene and look for Mallory as long as he possibly could. So only the four of them were taken to the hospital, and this is where police tried to start their actual interviews. But before police could actually get their questions in, Paul's father and grandfather showed up to the hospital, which prevented them from asking any questions. We will get more into how and why this happened in just a few minutes. Then the next day, police deployed boats, divers, and helicopters all to search the waters for Mallory. After searching for almost the entire day, Anthony finally agreed to go to the hospital and get treatment for his own injuries. But three days had passed and Mallory still had not been found. So the Beach family came to the media to ask the boating community for help in all of their searches. They asked all of the crabbers and the fishermen to just keep their eyes
eyes open and help them out with their searches. The Beach family and Anthony spent every single day, every waking hour at the Bridge Causeway for six days searching for Mallory. Then by March 3rd, two brothers in the community agreed to come out and help with the searches for Mallory. Around 1 p.m., they launched their boat and started searching near the Broad River boat landing where other volunteers had gathered to help search. They drove their boat for around 20 minutes before one of the men spotted what looked to be a blonde woman floating in the marsh line around five miles away from the original crash site. They immediately called 911 and police arrived shortly after. After a further examination, the body was confirmed as belonging to 19-year-old Mallory Beach. The medical examiner later confirmed that Mallory's cause of death was the result of drowning and blunt force trauma to the head. The family was obviously completely devastated, but they were happy to finally have some answers in this horrible tragedy. By March 7th, the family held a funeral for their beautiful daughter who was taken far too soon. More than 500 people showed up to mourn the loss and celebrate her short life. Now, at this point, everything seemed to be very black and white. Paul was drunk. He was acting erratically, and because of his irresponsible actions and complete disregard for everybody else on the boat, Mallory was killed. However, police weren't so quick to look at it this way, and there are a few reasons as to why, so let's get more into that. So now going back to the original scene, when police took down their reports, they initially said that it was not clear who was driving the boat at the time of the crash. However, Every single person on the boat said that Paul was the one who was driving, and they were pretty darn sure that he was the one who accelerated the throttle. Now, I will note that during a police interview, Anthony was asked if he knew for sure that Paul was the one who accelerated the boat and caused the crash. But Anthony said that the boat had accelerated so fast that no one saw who actually hit the throttle, but they confirmed that Paul was the one who was steering the boat at the time. They said that he was the one standing right next to the throttle when it happened. So, no, he did not necessarily see Paul yanking the throttle, but he was standing right next to it right before it was pulled. So, in conclusion, it's pretty obvious that Paul was the one who pulled the throttle. Police also didn't do any field sobriety or breathalyzers at the scene or at the hospital to see how intoxicated everybody was because, again, they were all very visibly intoxicated, especially Paul. When the officer was asked why he didn't do any field sobriety tests, he said that simply it was because they could not determine who the driver was at the time. Then we know as soon as they got to the hospital, Paul's father and grandfather showed up at the hospital and made it impossible for police to question them or do any field sobriety tests. So three weeks after the crash, the Beach family filed a wrongful death suit in Beaufort County against everybody who they believe contributed to Mallory's death. These parties included the bar that Paul went to, the convenience store that sold him alcohol, and James and Christy Wood for serving them alcohol even though they knew they were underage. But shortly after this, their lawsuit was dismissed. But then after this original one was dismissed, the family filed their second lawsuit, this time in Hampton County. This lawsuit named Parker's Convenience Store, as well as Richard Murdaugh, Paul's father, and Richard Buster Murdaugh Jr., Paul's older brother. They dropped the other defendants and added Paul's father and brother for letting them use their false identification to purchase alcohol. So the Murdaughs hired two attorneys, Amy Bauer and John Tiller, who were both named on the 2019 list of South Carolina super lawyers to represent them in this lawsuit. As far as I've seen, this case is set to go to trial at some point in the future. Then, four weeks after the crash, the sheriff's office officially recused themselves of this investigation due to their long-standing relationship with the Murdoch family, which we will get into again in just a minute. But this entire time, Paul was not being held accountable for any of his actions. It was seven long weeks before any sort of charges whatsoever were brought against Paul. On April 18th, Paul appeared in front of a grand jury which indicted him on one count of boating under the influence and two counts of boating under the influence and causing great bodily injury. He pled not guilty to those charges and was released on a $50,000 bond. But several news outlets and reporters have claimed that throughout this entire process of being charged and taking him in and booking him that he was given special treatment. Throughout this entire process of going in front of a judge, normal people have to await their pretrial hearing in jail. But 
Paul never saw the inside of a jail cell. He didn't even have a normal mugshot taken. He was wearing a collared shirt and the photo was taken on somebody's phone in a hallway. He was never placed in handcuffs and he was never made to wear a jail uniform. Reporters said that this was because the family didn't wanna have pictures going around of their son in a jumpsuit and in jail and that could look really bad for the family. So of course he didn't have to be cuffed or wear a uniform like everybody else does because they just can't have that publicity. Also, even though he was facing DUI charges, the state made no restrictions regarding him driving a boat or drinking alcohol. He also had the conditions of his bond modified so that he doesn't have the inconvenience of staying within the original five county limit. He was able to travel throughout the state as he pleased. And again, no charges were brought against him for seven weeks until he was finally charged. After this incident, there were a few other incidents of boating accidents resulting in bodily harm and death as the result of an intoxicated driver in the same areas within South Carolina. In all of those other cases, the drivers were charged and taken to jail the very same day for their DUIs as they awaited their trial. So, Clearly, Paul was treated a little bit differently than all of those other people were. Then, after Paul did stand in front of a jail and was released on bail for months, a trial date had never been set. So at this point, you might be wondering why Paul was getting such special treatment or why the sheriff's office recused themselves of investigating. Well, Turns out the Murdoch family is actually quite the prominent and powerful family in that area of South Carolina. The Murdoch family had actually been serving as the 14th Circuit Judicial Solicitor for over 85 years. The 14th Judicial Circuit covers over five counties in the area, which includes Allendale, Beaufort, Colleton, Hampton, and Jasper. They prosecute up to 5,000 cases per year, ranging from all sorts of different charges, from misdemeanor theft charges to felony murder convictions. In South Carolina, a judicial solicitor is comparable to that of a state or district attorney in other jurisdictions. Randolph Murdoch Sr. was the first 14th Circuit solicitor to be elected into that position in 1920. In 1940, he was unfortunately killed in a train accident. After he passed away, Randolph Buster Murdoch Jr. served from 1940 until he retired in 1986. This made him the longest standing solicitor at that time. Then after he served, his son, Randolph Murdoch III, was elected and served until retiring in 2005, where he moved on to a private practice as a lawyer. Then his son, Richard Alexander Murdoch, works as a volunteer prosecutor in the 14th Judicial Circuit. In addition to their long-standing history as a district solicitor, the family has practiced civil law since 1910. Randolph Murdoch Sr. started the firm that year and practiced law until he died in 1940. His son also worked for the law firm until 1987. Then his son and two grandchildren also practice law in the same area. So then Randolph III, as well as his two sons, Randolph IV and Alexander Murdaugh, also practice law at the firm. It is now called PMPED, which stands for Peters, Murdaugh, Parker, Elstroth, and Dietrich. The firm, which spans over three counties and has several locations, is known for winning huge cases involving millions of dollars for cases involving wrongful death suits and bodily harm charges. So they have over a 100 year long legacy in South Carolina, and of course, the family is very wealthy. It's said by people who live there that it's really hard to find just about anybody who doesn't know or hasn't been affected by the Murdoch family. They are very influential in the area and they have been for over a century. However, in an event that shocked and horrified so many people, at around 9 to 9.30 p.m. on June 7th, 2021, Paul Murdoch and his mother, Maggie Murdoch, were found dead after being shot of their 1,770-acre property in Colton County. So at 10.07 p.m. that day, Alex Murdoch called 911 and told dispatchers that he had just gotten home and found the bodies of his wife and his youngest son laying next to dog kennels outside of the property, which is the property where the family operates a hunting lodge. It was found that Paul had been shot in the head and chest with a shotgun, while Maggie was shot in the head with what appeared to be 
an assault rifle. So it seems like two different guns were used in the attacks. Again, it was also said that they were killed sometime between 9 and 9.30 p.m. that same day. So Alex Murdoch found them about 30 minutes to an hour after they had died. Now, police are being very tight-lipped about this entire investigation. As you can imagine, there are a lot of people invested in this case who want to know what happened. So, I'm going to go over what we do know so far and let me tell you there is so much more. This case has so many layers. The more I research, the more I find. So here we go. Now, there have been a few things that were released about the crime scene. It was said that there were shell casings found near their bodies, but there were no weapons and nothing else that had been found on the crime scene or near their bodies. Also at the crime scene, Paul's cell phone had been found right near his body, but initially Maggie's cell phone had not been found. It wasn't until the evening on the following day on June 8th that a family member using the Find My iPhone feature had found her cell phone laying in a roll road in the area. But it has not been released where exactly the phone was found, how far away from them it was found, or anything else related to that. Police have said that they're trying to get prints or DNA evidence from the phone, but it actually rained on the night of the murders, so it's going to be very difficult to know whether they can get any of this evidence from the phone or not. And of course, initially, police had several suspects in mind of who could be responsible for these murders, including Alex Murdaugh. A lot of times in murders, the family member is the first person that police look into. However, it turns out that Paul's grandfather and Alex's father Father, Randolph Murdaugh III had actually died a few days after these two murders. So the same day that Paul and Maggie were shot, Alex says that he was actually driving his father to the hospital. He had cancer and it seemed like his health was deteriorating very quickly. So after taking his father and dropping him off at the hospital, he says he got home and that is when he discovered the bodies of his son and his wife. It also came out that shortly before Paul and Maggie's death, Paul had been receiving new numerous death threats online. Paul's uncle and Alex's brother, John Murdaugh, said that they did not think that these death threats were credible at the time. He said that if he thought these death threats were credible, he would have contacted somebody, but he didn't, and now he's really regretting that decision. And of course, the other people on the boat at the time of Mallory's death have also been considered as being responsible. But in the wake of this news, they voluntarily came forward to give their DNA to clear their names of these murders. So it seems like they probably aren't the ones responsible either because they were so willing to clear their names by giving their DNA. But whether the people on the actual boat were responsible or not, Obviously, as you can imagine, there's a lot of theories surrounding their death that they may have been in retaliation to Mallory's death. But overall, law enforcement has declined to comment on any of the suspects or motives that they're looking into. But the more that we find out about the Murdoch family, the more that comes out about other possible motives. Turns out Mallory Beach isn't the only person whose death has a connection to the Murdaugh family. After looking into the Murdaughs, more have come out about other deaths that the Murdaugh family could be connected to. Six years ago, on July 8th, 2015, a 19-year-old man named Stephen Smith was found dead in the middle of Sandy Run Road in Hampton County, South Carolina, and he was in horrible condition. His face was absolutely covered in blood and he had a 7.25 inch gaping hole on the right side of his forehead. His shoulder was partially dislocated and he had cuts and bruises all over his right hand. He had horrific injuries and somebody had just left him there to die in the middle of the road. Stephen Smith was described as being intelligent and kind. He was an openly gay young man in his small town of Hampton, South Carolina, which had its own challenges but he chose to make the best out of it and make a better life for himself. In high school, he earned straight A's and he was voted most likely to become a medical physician or to rule the world. Either one, I mean, I guess the two are pretty close, but either way, he was absolutely adored by everybody around him. He was actually in nursing school and he was actually on his way home from school on the night of his death. So when investigators arrived to the scene, they were immediately confused confused. Despite his horrific wounds and the horrible condition of his body, his loosely tied shoes were still on his feet, and his clothes appeared to be completely untouched and unbothered. Then both his
his phone and his keys were still in his pocket. You would think that if he had been hit by a car and that's what happened to him, that these items would have flown out of his pocket and that his shoes probably would have come off. Then they found his car three miles away from his body on the side of Bamberg Highway with his wallet still inside of the car. They saw that his gas cap had been unscrewed and it was hanging outside of the gas cap door. Investigators got the impression that he probably ran out of gas and was starting to walk home before something happened to him. At first, the medical examiner ruled his death as a hit and run. However, it was later overturned and it was ruled as a shooting homicide. But still, investigators were completely stumped. There was absolutely no evidence at the scene. No bullets, no shell casing, no gunshot residue, no tire marks, no vehicle debris, nothing. They searched all up and down the road and in the adjacent cornfield and they found absolutely nothing. But then the medical examiner made the confusing decision to change the cause of death back to a hit and run accident. At this point, it was theorized that as he was walking down the side of the road, a mirror on a semi truck had hit his head as the semi truck was driving by and that is how he died. But there were still a lot of detectives who questioned this decision. One detective from the multidisciplinary accident investigation team, Todd Proctor, whose main duty it was to investigate accidents, did not agree with this ruling. He wrote in a report that when he went to speak with the medical examiner, Dr. Aaron Presnell, for some clarification, he was immediately met with the cold shoulder. He said that he was immediately told that she was too busy to speak, and even if she did want to talk to him, she couldn't because she didn't have the consent of the Hampton County Coroner. When Proctor told her that he had just spoken to the county coroner the day before, she basically called him a liar. He said that when he asked her if she wanted him to call the county coroner on his phone, she backed off. He told her that what she reported was not aligned with what any of the evidence was pointing to, and she really didn't have any answers to that. She just straight up met him with resistance and was not willing to consider anything else. He said that the only evidence that she had listed on her report was that he was found in the middle of the road. Absolutely nothing else in her report supported a hit and run. Steven's family also disagreed with the report. They said that he was always very aware of his surroundings, so there was no way that he'd be paying such little attention that he wouldn't have heard a semi-truck coming up behind him, getting so close to him that it hit him in the head. Now, some could argue that maybe that night he was intoxicated or was on drugs or something like that, but then, when they did the toxicology report, it was shown that Stephen was completely sober at the time of his death. So, again, it's not like he was on drugs or he was drunk when he was walking on the side of the road, which caused him to pay any less attention. Now, throughout the course of the investigation into Stephen's death, the Murdoch name was mentioned over 40 times. In the initial stages of the investigation, investigators were looking both into Paul Murdoch and his older brother, Buster Murdoch, as possible persons of interest. There was was a rumor going around that Buster was intimately involved with Stephen at some point. According to Sandy Smith, Stephen's mother, he had told his twin sister that he had a fling with Buster and that he had planned a deep sea fishing trip with him for some time in July. And as we know, he was killed on July 8th. So that can be a motive if Buster wanted this to stay a secret since he was in this high profile, powerful, rich family. Sandy says that Paul and Buster Murdaugh were on their way home from a baseball game the night that Stephen was killed. She said that Stephen drove this ugly little banana car and everybody who saw the car knew that it belonged to Stephen. So she said that it's possible that they were sort of following him and that they saw him pull over and that when he pulled over, the boys were behind him with their baseball bat and that is when they came up and hit him and killed him. Now, I will note that Sandy did not say these boys' names specifically as far as I have seen, but but they have been named numerous times in relation to this case generally, so it's thought that the person that she's referring to in all of this are Paul and Buster Murdaugh. This would explain why there were no tire marks indicating that anyone tried to slow down to avoid hitting him. If it was on purpose, there would be no attempt to slow down, whereas if this was an accident, you'd think there would be tire marks indicating that somebody slammed on their brakes to slow down to avoid an accident. This entire situation would also explain why his body was found in such 
such an inconsistent manner as to what the medical examiner was saying. There have also been people who called in anonymously to name the Murdaugh boys in the death. One of the anonymous callers said that his stepson had named the names of who had struck Stephen in the head, causing his death. This person said that he was actually calling because Randy Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh's uncle, told him to call. One of the investigators made it clear that he was frustrated that so many other investigators are too afraid to talk to the Murdaugh family. He said, quote, the Murdaughs, as big and powerful and rich as everybody thinks they are, they're going to go on living their lives like nothing happened. So they can play the card that they care about everybody else. No, they don't. They care about protecting themselves. He said that he truly does not believe that this was a hit and run. He said that they are not classifying this as anything other than a murder. He said that he doesn't care who you are or how much money you have. He's going to find out what happened. In 2016, Sandy Smith, Stephen's mother, wrote to lawmakers to talk about just how much corruption is hindering this case. She said that she believes that the Murdaughs have influence on the pathologist, Dr. Aaron Presnell, who was the one who performed Stephen's autopsy. Others who were present at the autopsy came out and said that there was no mention of a car strike striking Stephen at the time that they were completing their examination, yet somehow Dr. Presnell still ruled his death as a hit and run. She also talked about how combative and rude she was when Todd Proctor tried talking to her to clear up her examination findings. There were no debris found at the scene, no broken glass found in Stephen's head to support that he was hit with a mirror, no tire marks that showed that somebody had tried to break or get out of the way. It just was not possible that this was the sole cause of death. She also noted how there appeared to be missing evidence from the case, including DNA that was scraped from underneath Stephen's fingernails, the clothing that he was wearing, and a rape kit that they had done on him. She said that this case had mysteriously bounced from one investigator to another without any reason. She said that the case repeatedly would get to a certain point, then the assigned officer would just bow out. She said that maybe these officers were just too afraid to take the case to Solicitor Murdaugh. She wrote, it's apparent from the first week of the investigation that the authorities are covering up critical evidence and we no longer know who to trust. Sandy has come out and said that it's a huge slap in the face that Stephen's case is just now only being reopened six years later only because Paul and Maggie Murdaugh had been shot. It's almost like they don't care when poor people die, but the second someone from a rich and powerful family dies, it suddenly matters again. But investigators have said that as they are looking into Paul and Maggie's murders, they have found more information that has led them to reopening the case. They said that they are taking on Stephen's case with a fresh set of eyes that will be looking at old evidence as well as new evidence that they are finding. So, even though it's been far too long. At least this case is being reopened and maybe Stephen will finally get some justice for his horrific death. Now, if you thought this case would be over after that, then you'd be wrong. The Murdaughs have a possible connection to yet another death. This time, the death of a 57-year-old woman named Gloria Satterfield. She was the Murdaugh's housekeeper and she was found dead on February 26th, 2018, after she trip and fell in the Murdaugh home. Gloria Satterfield had two sons, Brian Harriet and Michael Anthony Satterfield. She had been married to a man named David Satterfield, but she was widowed at the time of her death. She was described as loving to laugh, and she was very outgoing. She loved tennis, and she loved spending time with her kids, and she loved the color purple. After her death, a representative from her estate filed a wrongful death suit against Alex Murdaugh, so Paul's father. The court filing said that Murdaugh's insurance company would pay out $500,000 plus $5,000 for her medical bills. This claim was settled on October 5th, 2020. Other than this, there literally has not been anything else released about her death, but of course, it's speculated that there is more to this story. I even looked at these court documents and that is all it says. It literally just says that they were sued and that they settled for that amount of money. Doesn't say what her injuries were. It doesn't say what exactly caused her death. That is all it said in the court documents. This is just me speculating, but to me, it feels like the only reason why you'd want to keep something so hush-hush is if there were certain things about the situation that you didn't want coming out. It's just really sad because it's said that Gloria loved Alex and Maggie as if they were her own family. 
then something horrible just happens to her and it's just that. It's just so horrific. So that is pretty much all that's been released about the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdaugh and the connections that they may have to other deaths. We still have absolutely no idea who killed them and as we can see, there are many people who may have the motive to want to kill them. The family has come out and said that they don't know of any enemies that genuinely would want to come out and hurt them. They said that even with all of this talk about Paul, they say that they're just normal people and they don't know why people would want to come out to hurt them so badly. Those who knew Maggie said that she was a very kind and gentle soul who wouldn't want to hurt anybody. People have acknowledged that maybe she wasn't tough enough on Paul and that he really did have some of these crazy and outrageous behaviors, but Maggie herself was known as a kind woman who was loved by everybody who knew her. I'm personally not going to put out any of my opinions on Maggie or the rest of the family. Obviously, we know that before Paul's death, he had some horrific behaviors and he may be the cause of death for many other people, if not just Mallory. Either way, they are both dead. I don't know anything about Maggie. I don't know anything about the rest of their family other than what's been made available. I'm not going to say anything beyond that. We only know of the behaviors that have been reported on in relation to Mallory's death and obviously we can get that Paul did not have the kindest behaviors. He was not the kindest person. He had some behavioral issues. He did a lot of things that he shouldn't have done. He clearly was a spoiled rich kid, but I'm not going to speak anything on his mother. I'm not going to speak on anybody else in the family because we simply don't know and I don't think that it's my place to be talking about this family who I know nothing about, who I only know in connection to these horrible things that they're involved with. I do feel for Alex Murdaugh who had to take his father to the hospital, watch him die of cancer, and come home and find his wife and his son dead. Nobody deserves that. Whether you say that he didn't punish Paul enough for his behaviors, whether he was even trying to cover up or help Paul get out of what he did, I don't think any father deserves to come home and find his wife and his son dead. That is just horrible and I would never wish that on my worst enemy. The Murdaugh family is also putting out a $100,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of whoever is responsible for the murders. And obviously, after Paul has died, all of the charges against him in relation to Mallory's death have been dropped. The Beach family also came out and wanted everybody to know that they would never wish this kind of hurt on anybody else, especially since they have gone through the same tragedy themselves. The family representative came out on behalf of them and said, quote, the Beach family extends its deepest and warmest sympathies to the Murdaugh family during this terrible time. Having suffered the devastating loss of their own daughter, the family prays that the Murdaughs can find some level of peace from this tragic loss. They would like the family and the community to know that their thoughts and continued prayers are with the Murdaughs. It is their most sincere hope that someone will come forward and cooperate with authorities so that the perpetrator of these senseless crimes can be brought to justice. Which is obviously just such a mature and respectable thing to come out and say. I give the Beach family my complete respect for coming out and saying that they could have blamed Paul for everything that happened to Mallory, but they know what it's like to lose a child and they wouldn't want anybody else to be put through that hurt. At this point, there is so much speculation and so many rumors online that it's really difficult to figure out what's true and what isn't. I left pretty much anything out that I wasn't sure about and I just didn't want to include a lot of information that seemed seem to be more rumors and more speculative. So there is more that I have read in articles about this, but again, I only tried to include information that I saw in multiple sources and seemed more accurate. I've even seen several articles that are combating the rumors surrounding this case. They'll say in bold letters, you know, what the rumor is, and then there'll be a paragraph about why that rumor is wrong. So there will be so many sources listed down below. It's 
probably going to be a pretty hefty lift of sources, but feel free to read through any of those if you want to find out any more about this case. This is just such a huge case and there are so many theories as to what could have happened and who can be responsible for the murders of Paul and Maggie Murdaugh. And honestly, after spending so many hours researching, I am at a complete loss. I have no idea who I think may be responsible and I believe that there's probably so much more information out there that we just don't know about that the family may have been involved with. There may be something even bigger at play that they just aren't releasing. Stephen's mother and others involved in the case have already accused investigators of hiding things or covering things up with these murders. And like I said, police have been very, very tight-lipped about this entire thing. The person currently serving as solicitor did work under Murdoch, so he has been called to recuse himself of the murder investigation, just like he recused himself of the investigation into Mallory's death, but as of me recording this, he has not yet done so. Again, there's probably so much more information to this case that we just don't know about, so I'm really looking forward to following this case and finding out even more information about this all in the following months. But with that, I'm going to end the video there. I don't want to spend the time to go over all of the different theories because there's just so many different possibilities and I wouldn't even know where to start. So that is all I have for today's video and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. I am so excited to discuss this case with you guys. There's so much to talk about, so please feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. With that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if there's anything that comes out about this case after I post it, I will be posting it to my Twitter. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!